All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome officially to the final week of our project management body of knowledge seven, PMBOK seven short course with the wonderful Karen Wright presenting. Uh, my name, as usual, is Jack Stewart. Uh, we have Kit is uh, doing the admin side of things for us this week for IT Masters, and Karen will be presenting in just a moment. Um, before we begin, uh, IT Masters is based on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and we pay respect to their elders and ancestors and acknowledge their sovereignty was never ceded, and they maintain an ongoing connection to the lands, waters, and culture um, of theirs for thousands of years. Um, so we are going to start in just a moment uh, looking at the final, the content for the final uh, short course. And before we do so, a um, little bit of housekeeping really, really quickly. So um, for those of you who are um, attending your first one of these today, welcome firstly. Um, thanks so much for coming along. Welcome back to everybody who is um, attending their second, third or fourth one of these. Um, if you'd like to connect with your peers in the chat section, please uh, use the chat um, to talk, like the one that's labeled as chat to have a, a chat with your uh, fellow participants. Um, and you can set who can see your messages to everyone. And that way um, you'll be able to get feedback and interaction from everybody that is in the room currently. Uh, if you have questions that are about the content of the um, course itself, please direct those to the Q&A section and we'll do our best to answer questions. Please keep them nice and specific to the topic that's at hand today. Uh, we're not going to have a huge amount of time for questions uh, this evening or morning, etc., depending on where you are. Um, and uh, yeah, so question for the mentor it goes in the Q&A section, question that's just general about, or, or just a comment um, that you'd like to sort of throw in there. Uh, we always appreciate that interaction with people. Um, and you can post that in the chat section. Uh, all materials from previous weeks and all materials uh, that are additional to the uh, short course uh, webinars can be found at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Uh, you can check out all of the discussions and you can continue on with all of the discussions from this course in there. Um, so yes, like I said, we have Kit who's going to be helping with the admin side of everything. Um, and I will be doing a little bit of that as well. Uh, please also uh, feel free to help us improve the IT Masters short course experience if you can by answering a couple of quick questions. Uh, Kit is going to post the link to our survey. Um, thank you very much, Kit. That's just in the chat. Um, let us know about your experience of the course as well. We really, really appreciate that. And it helps us, um, you know, improve and, uh, you know, create new short courses. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we will also have the exam for this. We'll be open at 12 p.m. Melbourne time. That's Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, tomorrow. It will be a 40 question multiple choice exam and it will be uh, one attempt will be allowed per person. So um, that will be opening tomorrow and that will be available for some time. Uh, all of these webinar materials will be available within 24 hours at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, and then uh, as I've mentioned earlier in the course, this is uh, material that is taken from uh, MGI 511, which is one of our subjects called Project Management Fundamentals. It's taught by Karen. Uh, it's based around the Project Management Institute methodology, methodology that we've been going through uh, throughout this course, um, preparing students for the project management professional or similar certification. Um, and so if you are interested in studying uh, with IT Masters, studying the full length subject that this material is taken from, uh, then you have the option of studying a graduate certificate, a graduate diploma, or a master of project management. Um, and you can have a look at the details of those on the IT Masters website, which Kit has also very helpfully posted the link to. 
Um, there are, you know, a lot of options for if you have um, previous uh, bachelor level or postgraduate level study. Alternatively, if you have ad adequate um, or relevant equal work experience or industry certification experience, that can also help you gain entry. If you're interested in finding out what your study options are and you're potentially interested in studying with us, um, you can fill in our very simple form, our eligibility form, uh, and you might even get a little chat with me on the phone after that, as I often call people um, to discuss their eligibility um, as well, which is fantastic. Um, and we're always happy to answer your questions. So check that out as well. Um, yeah, that should be all of the housekeeping for us now, IT Masters obviously partners with Charles Sturt University to deliver those courses. It's a leading Australian university for uh, IT and similar subject areas. Um, and yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this course. And if you are not planning on doing further study, absolutely fine. You're incredibly welcome to continue to do this course and any of our other short courses. Um, and I will just mention finally that if you complete and pass three of our online free short courses, you are able to claim one subject worth of uh, course credit towards any of our um, graduate certificates, graduate diplomas or uh, master's degrees as well. So now that that housekeeping is done, remember uh, content questions, comments, etc. for everybody to see goes in the chat. Questions about the specific uh, course content goes in the Q&A section. And I'll hand over to Karen. Karen, take it away. Thanks very much, Jack, and welcome back. Uh, and welcome to everybody. Uh, this week, we are going to uh, talk about the, the fourth and final uh, part of uh, Pinbox 7, as um, Jack's pointed out there. So the first week, of course, uh, for those of you, this is your first night, but the first week, um, we covered the, the standard uh, of project management, and we talked about the, uh, the 12 principles that guide behaviour. And then we spent weeks two and three working through uh, the eight performance domains. We tackled four in the first, or the second week, I should say, and then four in the third week. Uh, and then this last week, we're going to talk about tailoring. Uh, so one of the things that Pimbok has recognised, and I think all project managers recognise, is that there is no one best way to manage projects, that uh, there are different methods out there, that there are different approaches, uh, different tools that we use, and different ways of going about managing projects. And uh, that really the, the choice uh, out there is is enormous, uh, that there's lots of different options available to, to project managers and project teams, and that we really need to, to tailor our approach uh, to our project based on a number of different factors, including the kind of organisation we're working in, the kind of project we're working on, the kind of product we're building, you know, the size of the team and all of those sorts of things. So there's some critical decisions that as project managers and project teams, we have to make uh, around our approach to our project. And really this third section of the, the BOC um, after the performance domains is really focused on that tailoring and how to make sure that you're choosing the best models, the best, me best, me best methods, <laughs> sorry, lisping away there, uh, and the best artefacts for your unique project because each project is very unique and, and needs a different approach. So um, it's very much horses for courses. So let's get started on, on this. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, PRINCE2 would already have a fair idea about tailoring. So tailoring uh, is about adaptation. And uh, if, you've, if you've studied PRINCE2 before, which is a, a method of project management, uh, tailoring is quite... Um, emphasized uh, in, in their methodology. So they talk extensively about, you know, everything other than the principles themselves are things that you can tailor uh, in, in a PRINCE2 project. And Pimbok have picked up on that, realized that uh, a lot of uh, PRINCE2 practitioners and a lot of agile practitioners and even a lot of waterfall practitioners these days are trying to deliberately adapt various different parts of their project management approach, their governance approach, their processes, in order to make sure that that project is going to deliver optimum results within the environment that it's working in and the work that's being done on the project as well. So this really recognises and, and it's Pinbox way of recognising that there is more than one way to manage a project and that the exact approach that we are going to use really needs to be carefully considered, that we shouldn't just 
you know, start off and, and sort of see how it goes and then, you know, make, make um, wholesale changes down the road. But we need to really think through and, and make some careful and deliberate decisions early uh, and be prepared, though, to be flexible and to make changes if we do need to. Uh, so the way that we, or the things that we can tailor, we'll talk about in this webinar and we'll talk about the ways that we can tailor and how we can use um, different models, different methods and different artefacts to get a, a really good outcome uh, on our projects. So uh, we'll be talking about the development approach, the life cycle, the deliverables, the processes, and of course, the people. All right, uh, so the question begs why Taylor? Uh, and I think I've given a fair kind of hint uh, as to that, uh, you know, throughout the, the first part of this webinar. One of the things that uh, we do find if we, if we do some tailoring is that we'll often get better results, better performance. Um, the project will go more smoothly. Uh, you know, we'll be able to adhere to the schedule more closely or, or to the budget more closely or to the scope more closely and just get, you know, a, a more smooth running and more efficient uh, and effective project. So just better project performance. Um, and even if the project performance is not better by the cho choice of the right um, models or the right tools, oftentimes it, it just makes the process of tracking the project a lot easier though. So that's either better performance or better tracking of performance that, that you'll get out of tailoring. Um, the ability to optimise outcomes, the ability to be able to see where, you know, if we make a few tweaks over here or we make some changes over there, that we're going to get a better result out of our project as well. So it's not just about the, the project running more smoothly, but about getting a better outcome or a better result as well. Uh, greater engagement from your stakeholders uh, is often the result of tailoring as well. Uh, more efficient use of resources. Uh, being able to cater to the unique needs of every project and not just treat them all the same uh, and, and really apply uh, the right amount of structure and rigour uh, dependent on what is needed for the project. So one of the things that, uh, that I've spent a bit of time doing in my career as a consultant is advising organisations on the methods and the frameworks that they use in their organisations to get optimal results. And, you know, things, the landscape's changed on that a little bit. So you're going back a few years, uh, a lot of, say 10 years, uh, a lot of organisations wanted the same approach right across the board. They wanted maturity, they wanted consistency, uh, and they wanted every project manager within their organisation to manage projects exactly the same way. And some of you might still be sort of working in that kind of environment where, you know, the organisation says, well, we're a Prince 2 shop and so this is how we do it. Um, or we're agile and this is how we do it. We're scrum or whatever and this is how we do it. And there's nothing wrong with that approach. It does make it a lot easier for the organisation to roll out training and to make sure everybody's, you know, across the method and, and the PMO is usually, uh, you know, right across training people, coaching people, mentoring people in, in relation to those methods and getting good results. The problem is that uh, not all projects need the same thing. Uh, so there will always be a, a range of different projects running across most organisations. Some are very complex, very expensive and very risky, and others are much less likely to fail or, you know, even if they did fail, they're not going to have a huge impact on the organisation. So some require a lot of structure and a lot of rigour and a lot of, you know, um, uh, you know, hoops and, and jumps to get through to, to make sure they get approved and, and to make sure that, you know, they're, they're tracked adequately and, you know, that they, they can't fly under the radar and that that project manager can't just sort of, you know, um, you know fly under the radar there. Uh, but other projects need that lighter touch. Other projects, you know, might need uh, a lot less governance, a lot less structure and a lot less uh, documentation, for example. So one of the, um, the, I guess the criticisms of project management, uh, formalised project management, is the amount of documentation we seem to have to produce. Uh, and uh, that's all because of that structure and that rigour to say, oh, well, we need a charter because we've got to capture all of these things and we need a, you know, a business case because we've got to have a, you know, a really uh, carefully put argument for the project and the different options that we've got. Whereas some projects don't actually need a full business case. They might only just need you know, a section uh, within the charter document that basically sets out the justification for the project. Um, so, you know, some, some projects need more than others and uh, it is a good idea to, to use what is right for the project. Um, you know, if things are too heavy handed and too difficult, then, you know, that's when people just start not applying them in the organisation and not using uh, the, the tools and the structures that they've got uh, and they start walking away from it. And then the organisation kind of starts to lose its grip on its own methods and its own frameworks and things like that and then all sorts of problems can creep in. So we do want something that is going to be um, fitting for the project uh, and is going to 
uh, enable uh, projects to be delivered efficiently and effectively and smoothly, uh, but to deliver on the outcomes, you know, without without sacrificing, you know, um, governance and you know scopes and budgets and things like that. So tailoring is useful for making sure that uh, you know that's done. So the steps for tailoring are set out in PMBOK in figure 3-1 there, uh, and it talks about how we go about choosing or making the choices in relation to tailoring. And what it says is that first, the first thing we need to make a decision about is the development approach. Now, we went through development approach and life cycle as a performance domain uh, back in week two. So what they're saying here is, you know, choose a development approach that is going to work for the project that you're working on. And then modify that based on the organisation. So depending on the type of organisation you work, work for. And then tailor for the project. So work out the, the, the things that you might need based on the size and the criticality and the other factors. So some of those things I was just talking about, about, you know, does this project need more sort of heavy governance or does it need a bit of a lighter touch and a, and a smoother transition? Uh, and, and then being able to inspect and adapt that, being able to implement that. Uh, and also to be able to bring in ongoing improvements as well, to be able to see where, you know, one of the things that we might have decided on perhaps isn't working as well as what we'd hoped uh, and make some decisions about how to tweak that or how to change that and how to adapt that so that it does work better going forward. So I would recommend that you, if you're going to tailor, that you start on the heavier side. Um, and then, you know, if you're finding that's that's too much, then kind of lighten it up. Uh, don't start on the lighter side of things and then try to add more rigour and add more structure to the project later because that's not really going to work. Um, you know, everybody wants to do less, nobody wants to do more kind of thing. So uh, that's something to bear in mind. But what we're saying here is look at your organisation, look at the projects you're running, you know, look for opportunities for ongoing improvement and, and try to structure a method and an approach based on all of that. Um, so a lot of organisations nowadays are starting to realise that there is this need for scalable approaches to project management um, and, you know, uh, lighter versions of documents and, um, you know, that kind of thing as well. And lots of organisations are also starting to realise that one method may not suit every kind of project that they operate. Uh, and so I, I see a lot more organisations that are open to ideas such as we'll run Prince2 for these kinds of projects, but we'll run, you know, Scrum on these kinds of projects um, and, and kind of running or running a hybrid method. So not really running a textbook Prince2 or a textbook Scrum or a textbook waterfall traditional project management, but, you know, to... to you know, make sure that, um, you know, we're getting the best of, of both worlds by, by combining and, and mashing these together and kind of making a bit of a hybrid method. And lots of organisations are doing that quite successfully uh, through, through that process. So it is about making sure that you, you know, you're not wasting time, you're not wasting money and you're not putting, you know, barriers in the way of, of smooth and efficient project management. Okay, so uh, what can we tailor? <laughs> just about everything, actually, uh, except if you Prince 2, you can't tailor the principles. So I just want to point that out for any Prince 2 practitioners that might want to pick me up on that point. But um, what we can tailor in project management generally, uh, the stakeholders, the project team. Uh, so, you know, you can have uh, a whole range of different stakeholders. You can have a, a large project team, a small project team. You can have a, a projectized environment where all of the, the project team members, you know, are, are assigned to the project and that's all they do. Or you could have a, a kind of a more matrix or functional structure where you've got, you know, people that are on the project team, but also working in the business, doing day-to-day -day jobs as well. Uh, you can change or, or tailor the, the development approach and the life cycle. So uh, you can choose how many life cycle phases or stages your project's going to have. Uh, you can choose whether or not you're going to do a, a predictive approach, uh, you know, a waterfall or traditional approach, or whether a more adaptive approach, like a, a, um, an agile approach is, is more for you, uh, or, you know, something that's got, um, you know, uh, structured you know, signposts or, or stopping points uh, like Prince2 might be something that's useful for your project. So it's really about trying to think about what you might be able to, uh, you know, what you might need to do in order to get the best results out of there as well. Um, Pinbox says we can tailor the planning um, so that we can, um, you know, make sure 
uh, you know, we can we can choose to, to plan it all up front or we can choose to just plan parts of the project or, or just this iteration. Uh, we can tailor the way we do project work. We can tailor the way we deliver the project. Uh, we can tailor the way we measure uh, our project. And also we can tailor the way we manage uncertainty on our project as well. Um, so we can choose to use a, a risk framework that the whole organisation uses, or we can choose a, a risk framework that's just going to be suitable for the project. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, just about those, um, those eight kind of performance domains. Um, now, I did just see quickly out of the corner of my eye, someone was saying tailoring the governance. You, you, see, you can do that. Um, Pinbok has never been big on the governance side of things. They don't, they don't talk about it um, as a performance area and they didn't talk about it as a knowledge area either in the last editions of Pinbok. They kind of weave governance throughout. Uh, they weave it in in a lot of different places um, throughout the different performance domains. Those of you that... that um, picked up on this, yes, the, the, the things that we can tailor are the eight performance domains. Um, so they, they weave it in in the stakeholder section, they weave it in in the development approach and life cycle section, they weave it in in project planning uh, and particularly in uncertainty and, and also uh, in measurement as well. So there's lots of different places that governance kind of appears, but they don't treat it as a, as a standalone performance domain. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something to bear in mind. All right, so um, PMBOK have given us a list of common situations uh, and some tailoring suggestions, which may or may not be helpful. I actually would have liked them to have spent a lot more time on this because um, unfortunately it's it's hard for them to uh, to give a, a generic kind of for this situation, apply this, this solution uh, or this suggestion. Um, but I really think that... Um, this, you know, is something that uh, it scratches the surface. Uh, and I think in the future, uh, if Pimbok gives us more of this, I think there'll be people that are quite interested in hearing what they've got to say. Uh, so based on, you know, the many, many uh, hundreds of years of experience of project management sitting around the tables at the PMI, they're saying for these situations on the left-hand side, here's some suggestions that we'd like to make for tailoring uh, on the right-hand side. So uh, I'm sure there's some experienced project managers amongst you that will, will look at these and go, oh, gee, I, I, you know, that, that's something to give it a go as well. So um, what they're saying is for poor quality deliverables, add more feedback verification loops and quality assurance steps. All right, so they're saying... There's, there's an op option for you, um, you know, within the, the stakeholder and the project team performance domains uh, and, and also in the project uh, work domains that, you know, here's something that you can do. You can, you can make sure you're getting more feedback back from your stakeholders and from your project team uh, and put some more quality assurance steps in there to make sure that your, your quality of your deliverables in, is enhanced. May not fix it, um, but they're saying that that's the things that they would recommend that you do in the event that you're faced with that situation. Uh, I'll just pick another one at random. Too much work in progress or high rates of scrap. So, uh, you know, a lot of waste going on there, a lot of inefficiency going on there. Uh, and they're saying the solution to that or the prescription for that is to use techniques like value stream mapping and Kanban boards to visualise the work, identify the issues and, and propose the solutions. So this is where uh, they're getting into the, uh, the realms of, of really talking about other methods and tools from other methods like Kanban boards, for example, is a, is a tool within the Kanban uh, methodology. Um, so they're recommending, almost recommending here that, you know, people really should be hybridising. Um, that uh, project managers really should be cherry picking from all of the different tools and methods and models and artifacts that are available to us across a whole range of different uh, formal and informal methodologies and, and frameworks and, and being able to use those on our projects regardless of our adopted method, so to speak. Um, lack of visibility and understanding of project progress. They're saying check to ensure appropriate measures are being collected, analysed, shared and discussed during team and stakeholder meetings, validate agreement with measures and within the team and with stakeholders. So these are kind of like tailoring suggestions from lessons learned from the people at PMI. Um, and as I said, I think uh, some of this is useful and uh, you know, I'd like to see a lot more of it incorporated in, in future versions of, of PMBOK. Uh, not sure what your thoughts are on that, but perhaps you'd like to, to talk about that in the chat. But um, you know, that this is useful, particularly for a, a, a junior project manager or project manager starting out. 
uh, who is trying to get their head around their organisation's way of running, running projects, uh, but also, you know, would like to, um, you know, to try a few different things from a couple of the different methods that are, might be available. All right, uh, so I'm just going to, oh, sorry guys, I just um, need to go back to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, the models. So PMBOK gives us a, uh, a definition of what a model is. Uh, so it's a thinking strategy that is used to explain a process, a framework or a phenomenon. Uh, so a lot of models that we use on project management are actually gleaned from general management. They're not actually built for project management, although some of them might be. Uh, they're more likely to come from other streams of management or business generally. And it's just that we happen to apply these models to project management and see if they work. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Uh, but some of the commonly used models are things like situational leadership models, communication models, motivation models, uh, change management models. Um, they're, they're quite applicable to project management a lot of the time, uh, whether it's the ADCAR model or the the, the unfreeze, change, refreeze model or, or the, you know, eight, the Cotter's eight-step uh, change management model. All of the change management models tend to kind of work quite well because what we're doing in projects is, is managing change. Uh, so they can be quite useful. Uh, complexity models, project team development models, but even just HR models or team development models like the Tuckman model, for example, you know, that's the one with the storming, norming, performing, uh, and so on, um, and conflict resolution models as well. Um, so they can all be applied to projects, even though they may not be have been designed or, or built for project management, they can certainly be sort of um, brought in uh, and made useful in the, in the project management realm. So what PMBOK have done is they've given us these uh, maps, if you like, these tables at the back in section three. And what they've tried to do for us here is give us some examples of models. Uh, and they've tried to say, these are the performance domains where you would most likely use these models. Now, again, you may uh, sort of say, look, I, I you know, might disagree with one or two of the location of one or two of these crosses, but uh, they give you a, a bit of an idea here of, of some of the, um, the different um, models that there are in general management terms that we can use uh, and where we might likely apply them. So as I said, this is really good stuff, particularly for the, for the junior project managers or the people that are just starting out in a project management career and, and maybe are a little bit bamboozled by all of the different models that there are out there and trying to get a handle on, you know, what should I do in this situation? You know, my project's starting to slip and I'm starting to have some problems with some of my project team members. You know, what tool do I use? There's so many out there and, and I'm just so confused. So where do I go and what do I do? Uh, so these tables might help with that. Um, so what they're saying there is situational leadership models. There's situational leadership to an Oscar, the two there that they're talking about. Uh, so they're saying there that, uh, you know, the, the, the project team and the project work uh, performance domains are the two most relevant performance domains, you know, that, that you would see those used. So they're saying, you know, you probably wouldn't use it in, delivery and you're probably not going to use it in uncertainty, for example, those tiles are blank. Um, so, you know, the ADCAR model that we talked about before or the eight step process for leading change, that's a John Cotter model for those of you familiar with that. You know, they're saying we would use that with relation to stakeholders and we use it here and we use it here as well. Um, so uh, it just gives you an idea of, of when each of these things might be useful. Uh, and you can see there that there's quite a few that, that have a lot of crosses, uh, you know, the process groups, for example, um, is, is a model that they're recommending can be used across a whole range of different, uh, you know, in different situations. All right, uh, so that's models. Uh, I might stop there and see just, Jack, if there's any questions about models before I move on to methods. There are, there's a couple of questions. Uh, there are, well, there's a couple of questions about the content that we've covered so far. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily specific. Oh, nope. We've got one about uh, models. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I might start from the start, which is uh, Muhammad asks, is it fair to say that only a subset of stakeholders can be tailored, i.e. you cannot choose who the project sponsor might be. However, you can choose maybe the developers or the users who perform testing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I guess what they're saying there with that, uh, with, with stakeholders is, you know, you've got to choose 
you know, what, what, uh, what's going to be the most beneficial to the project. And, and you may not be able to choose the exact individuals, like they might be actually pre uh, determined before you come on as a project manager. Uh, but the, the box doesn't really uh, suggest that uh, it, this is just all the project managers realm either. They're saying this is what's best for a project. So uh, if the governance is, is making decisions before you come on board, they should be kind of tailoring at that point. They should be thinking about, you know, what's going to be the best makeup here, what's going to be the best structure. Uh, you may not be appointed onto the project as the project manager until a little bit later. Um, and those decisions decisions may have already been made, but they should have been made with tailoring in mind too, is what I guess what Pinbox sort of saying there. Um, but yes, quite true. So sometimes you, you will be able to start as the project manager, you're there on, from the first day, you're part of the, the scope gathering and you're part of the, uh, the requirements gathering processes and, and having the conversations with the sponsor or the steering committee about the budgets and the schedules. Sometimes it's, it's all decided for you before you get there. The people are decided, the team's decided. You may also be taking on a project that has already started, in which case you would be trying to, to tailor uh, going forward. Um, and so some of those things might already be predetermined for you in that situation too. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jessica asks, generally, will tailored projects usually meet extended resources, similar to standard software versus customised software? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I think what we're saying with tailoring is, here's all of the choices that we have available to us, which ones are going to work best as opposed from a standard model would take me this long. And if I deviate from that in any way, it's going to take the same amount or longer. Um, some people might even be able to make an argument for saying, well, if I choose the right uh, models, methods, artifacts, and so on at the beginning, and if I tailor appropriately, I should actually be able to shorten the, the duration of my, my work because I'm choosing the right methods. And so I'm less likely to make mistakes or have to do rework. Um, so what Pimbock is saying is, is not, you know, here's the standard and, and you know, add on these pieces. It's saying that, you know, that, that basically every project is a blank canvas uh, and your approach to that needs to be created um, from, from scratch. Um, and so, you know, you need to put some serious thought into how you're going to attack this and that and the other so that it all comes together with the, the best optimal outcome for the project. Great, thank you. Um, I think that we might skip over this one about the benefits of combining agile and waterfall approaches because that's been addressed a couple of times in the previous weeks. So uh, Takeshini, please uh, check out the content that's been recorded from previous weeks about combinations of different approaches. Uh, and finally, Stephen asks, in an earlier lecture, we covered the RACI matrix. I don't recall seeing tailoring in the list, should it be? Uh, so it's not necessarily a specific role or job that anyone will need to do. It's just something that the, well, something the project manager will need to do, but in consultation with the rest of the project team. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a task, if that's what you're referring to, Stephen. I, I would more sort of say that this is something that's going to be done throughout the project anyway. Um, there's some upfront decision making that has to be made that kind of locks you down to certain tracks like methods and things. Uh, and then once you, you're in that that process and, you, and you're running your project, the tailoring is something that you would do like running project team meetings. It's just a, a, a matter of course thing that you would be doing as part of your role as a project manager is just selecting the appropriate methods and models and tools and things as you're going. Great, thank you. And finally, um, are, you able, are you able to elaborate just very briefly on tailoring uncertainty, please? Yeah, so what I mean by that is the approach to uncertainty. So what you're going to be doing, obviously we can't remove uncertainty. If we, if that was an optional extra we could just do without, we'd obviously want to do without it. Um, what we're talking about when we're talking about tailoring uncertainty is tailoring our approach to uncertainty. Um, so every organisation has a risk appetite. Some organisations are going to have a, a larger risk appetite than others. And that may even vary from project to project. So what we're saying there essentially is that at the, at the beginning of your project, having a conversation with your, your project sponsor or your steering committee to say, look, what's your risk appetite on this particular project? And if they say, look, you know, no, it's, it's a compliance project. I really don't want to take any risks here at all. You know, keep it nice and safe. Uh, if we've got to spend more money and more time, do it. Uh, I'd rather a, a good outcome and, and a safe project. Uh, then if that's the case, then, uh, you know, you're, you're going to, to uh, you know, apply your 
um, or, or tailor your project accordingly and your project approach accordingly. Whereas other organisations might be, no, nope, we're going to be innovators here today. We're going to, you know, take a few risks here, not obviously with people's lives, but with, with um, you, you know, the, the, the business's reputation or financially take some risks, you know. We're just going to, to try to, to develop this innovative product and put it out there. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, we're going to have a very different approach to uncertainty than what we would if we were told that, no, we, we need a safe outcome and we need, you know, results delivered. So that's what they mean by tailoring uncertainty is just tailoring your approach to uncertainty. Great. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, we are clear on questions currently, so feel free to continue on. Excellent. So, uh, so with the, uh, the the commonly used uh, methods that we've got, so um, the method is uh, is is a, a means for delivering, or, or sorry, for achieving an outcome, result, output, or deliverable. So, uh, method is a way of going about something, if you like. Uh, so, commonly used methods uh, that we list in Pinbock, and again, these aren't necessarily project management methods. Again, we're borrowing here from. Uh, other areas of, of management and of business generally as well. Uh, and things like data gathering and analysis methods, things like benchmarking, decision tree analysis, you've probably heard of lots of these, uh, reserve analysis, SWOT analysis, the old strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Uh, our different estimating methods, parametric estimating and historical estimating, having a meet, uh, meetings and events like daily stand-ups and sorry, daily stand-ups and kickoff meetings. So all of those things are ways to go about doing stuff basically on your project, and it may be a combination of, of project management approaches like. Um, uh, you know, daily stand-ups is, is a scrum term uh, for a daily meeting that's held uh, as part of an agile project and it, it gets held every day, it takes about, you know, 15 minutes or so just to go through what did we do yesterday, what are we planning to do today, what are the barriers that are all standing in our way. Uh, and a kickoff meeting is more used in a traditional waterfall project at the start of the project, you know, as part of, of saying, let's get this project started uh, and, you know, what are the, the main goals, what's the main scope, you know, what's the timeline and, and just going through some of those very early parts of the project, sort of the pre-planning meetings to get all the stakeholders on the same page so we can get going. So uh, it could be a combination of different things that you're doing there, um, but, you know, again, uh, the methods are mapped to the performance domains of project management. So this is how they go. Uh, this is table 4-2. Four, four uh, and there's a few of these tables, like I've, I've tried to screenshot them and pop them in, uh, and I appreciate they're probably not as big as what you would like uh, in your slides there and on your screens. But what they're saying is uh, something like benchmarking, for example, uh, would be you know, part of the delivery performance domain where we're delivering our product and we're measuring the outcome to say, did we achieve what we thought we were going to achieve or not? Uh, then we've got things like um, forecasting. They're saying that's part of the measurement uh, performance domain uh, there. Things like your SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. We'd use that as part of planning, but we'd also use that as part of managing uncertainty as well. So we were asked the question before about what do you mean by uh, tailoring uncertainty? Um, what we mean by that is if you look down this column here, you will see things like probability and impact matrix. As a, as a method for managing uncertainty. So the probability and impact matrix might come from our, um, our risk management framework for our organisation, or it might be a unique one that we've created for our project. So that's an example of how, you know, we've changed our methods to, to, to suit the project rather than just using a generic organisational wide one that maybe doesn't fit the project, for example. Um, you know, do we do a SWOT analysis or don't we? You know, that's, uh, that's something that, um, you know, we might, uh, might keep in mind as well. So for some projects, a SWOT analysis might be a really, really useful method. Uh, for other projects, the project manager might go, no, that's not really going to help us here. Uh, so I won't use it. So that's what we mean by tailoring uncertainty. Uh, what if scenarios are another way uh, to tailor uncertainty. So we don't do what if scenarios on every single project. Um, some project managers might find them useful on particular projects. Other project managers might say, no, I don't want to use them on this project. So we're tailoring the team, we're tailoring the stakeholders, we're tailoring the planning, the project work, the delivery, the measurement, the uncertainty, and so on. Uh, and these are some of the, the methods that we can use um, in, in order to do that. So hopefully that's making a bit of, a bit of sense. Um, this next one talks about estimating methods. So we use our estimating methods when we're doing our project planning. 
So our parametric estimating method is the one where you say, okay, if something's going to cost $100 a unit and I need three units, then that part of the project is going to cost $300. Uh, we've also got, uh, you know, other, other types of estimating, analogous estimating, where you use, you know, estimating from past similar projects to be able to, to work it out. So if that project took six months to do that particular piece of work, then it's likely that our project's going to take six months to do that particular piece of work. So that's a method of working out how long things are going to take, and that's applied in the, in the planning performance domain. Um, meetings. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it is project work that, that has to be done, uh, but that, that the meetings don't generally go into the uh, into the WBS or don't usually go into the RACI matrix because they're things that we just do uh, generally anyway as part of our, our project management. Um, so, uh, you know, things like uh, daily stand up meetings, they're used for planning, they're used for project work. I would argue that they're also used in measurement because we can sometimes talk about, you know, what we did yesterday and things like that as well. But, you know, some people may not think that's applicable. Uh, lessons learned, we use them in planning, we use them in project work, and we also use them in delivery as well. Um, planning meetings, used in planning. Obviously, that's a, a pretty clear one. A risk review, used in project work, but also used in uncertainty. So what they're trying to do here is sort of say, here's where you would most commonly come across these methods or, you know, if you're in the midst of delivery and you need a method for meetings and events, which one of these would you most likely go for or would you use all of them or would you use two of them? All right, so this is what tailoring is about. It's about looking at your unique project and saying, I really think iteration planning will be, uh, will be useful on this project or I really think that, you know, um, a product review is something we're definitely going to need on this project. Uh, whereas others, no, definitely don't think that that's going to be worthwhile. Um, so it's not, there's no right or wrong answers either, uh, which is the tricky part about project management. It's, it's really up to the project manager to sit down with the project team, with the governance layer, and work out what's going to work best for this particular project in this organisation operating in this current environment with all of the challenges that we've got and what we're facing. All right, uh, so the last one I wanted to cover was artefacts, but I might just stop there and ask if there's any questions firstly, Jack, in relation to the methods. Uh, yes, so Mohammed asks, refresher question, was parametric estimating about estimating probabilities on most likely, least likely, et cetera? I can't recall the formula, but it had an O and P and M in it. That's the three-point estimating. So the three-point estimating is the one where we have the optimistic estimate, the pessimistic estimate, and the most likely, which is somewhere in the middle. So parametric is the one where we're using productivity rates times by the, the quantity of, of whatever we're doing. So it's, it's um, for time, if it takes two days to do that job and we've got to do it five times, then it's a 10-day job in, in duration. Great. Um, thank you. And um, Augustina asks, can't lesson learned be used for uncertainty? Yeah, see, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm with you with that one too, Augustina. I, I look at that and think, mm, I, I think that lessons learned could be used for that as well. Uh, it could be used for planning and, and certainly uh, looking at what could happen. But, you know, if, if you start to get into a situation where you've got an issue unfolding, you know, looking at past lessons learned would, would potentially be useful. Uh, so, yes, some of these um, could definitely have crosses in, in other boxes as well. I think PIMBOK have tried to sort of use the most common usage rather than cover every possible scenario, but I do agree with what you're saying there. Absolutely. I think you could use it for uncertainty as well. Great. And just a quick follow-up question, uh, Augustine asks as well, is the parametrics used for risk management? Parametric is usually used for time and cost estimates. So when we're trying to work out how much something's going to cost or how long something's going to take. So we usually use it for how much something's going to cost. It's like how much is each unit times by how many units we need. Whereas if we're using it for time, it's how long does each specific task take times by, or how long does part of the task take times by how many parts of the task we need to get it completed. Great. Thank you so much. That's all the questions for now. All right, so we've got one more to go. We've done our models and we've done our methods. Uh, we are also going to cover artifacts. Now, models and methods, as I mentioned before, are things that we usually would bring in from other elements of management, general management, that we can apply to project management. Um, and some of them are project management specific things as well. 
The artifacts, though, do tend to be more project management specific stuff that we've done. Um, now, a lot of organisations use particular names for their artifacts. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you work in uh, a Prince2 uh, organisation, you will likely hear the word mandate uh, and PID, right? project initiation document. Whereas if you were uh, more of a traditional waterfall project manager and you subscribe to, to you know, Pimbok School of Thought, uh, then you would most likely use the words charter and then project management plan. But essentially, these are the same things. Um, and a lot of uh, organisations have different names for their documents that even step outside the, the general accepted kind of methodology ones. So uh, I've heard of a, a charter also being called a concept and brief. I've been heard, I've heard it called a, a project brief. I've heard it called a, a definition, an initiation document, you know, you name it. It's got a whole heap of different names. The plan's usually the plan, but if it's Prince 2, it's PID. Uh, you know, um, status reports, I've heard them called other things as well. I've heard change requests called variation requests. So every organisation does things differently, has its own little unique language and, and, um, and each methodology as well has, has different uh, terms for different documents that are essentially the same thing or fulfilling the same function and that's okay. Um, but an artefact can be a template, it can be a document, it can be an output or it could be a project deliverable. An artefact is basically stuff we're creating uh, as part of the project. So uh, some of our, our commonly used artefacts are things like our business case, our project charter, uh, all of the logs and the registers that we use throughout the project life cycle, things like the risk register, the change register, the lessons learned register, uh, the issues register, uh, all of our plans like our risk management plan, our scope management plan, our procurement plan, uh, things like contracts and also reports that we produce as well for our sponsor and steering committee, things like status reports. So when you think about all of these different documents and templates and outputs and deliverables and where they're stored in your organisation, uh, you can see here that there is a, a vast uh, amount that you could tailor here. Um, you could tailor in terms of the use of that. So an example just off the top of my head here is, uh, for example, a lot of project managers like to keep their risks and issues separate. So they'll have a risk register and they'll have an issues register. Whereas I know some project managers who like to keep their risks and issues in the same register and they have just a column in that register that says whether it's a risk or an issue. And as it changes status from one to the other, they just update the column, but they leave the whole document as one intact thing. Uh, I know organisations that like to keep their project management plans all in one big piece of software, whereas uh, I also know organisations that like to keep things separated. So the procurement plan belongs in a separate area than the, than the communications plan, for example. Uh, and, you know, they don't necessarily, you know, talk to each other as, as such. Uh, and you update one and then you go and update the other one separately, whereas well, some organisations have got these wonderful pieces of software where you update one thing and everything else just changes for you. Um, status reports are another example. You know, some organisations like them weekly, some like them monthly, some like them fortnightly, some like them fortnightly on one project, but monthly on another project. Um, so these are all things that we can tailor. And again, it has to be about starting with a blank canvas and making some deliberate decisions around what's best for this project in this organisation, in this current uh, climate that we're in. And just like the others, uh, Pimbot attempts to, to give us uh, some, uh, some mapping here to help us understand where each of these artefacts might likely uh, be, be applicable in, in terms of which performance domain we're working in. So they're saying there for a business case, that's stakeholders and planning. Uh, whereas for a project charter, it's still stakeholders and planning, but for a roadmap, it's, it's stakeholders, development approach and life cycle, and then planning. So they're saying, you know, you use the roadmap here too, perhaps. Um, if I'm looking at logs and registers and deciding which logs and registers I might need for my project, I might decide, yes, I'd like an assumption log. Yes, I'd like a change log. But not, not just deciding, yes, I want a change log, but what do I want it to have in it? Uh, do I want to just go with the organisation's standard, uh, you know, change control templates and, and change log? Uh, or am I allowed to, and do I want to, if I can, uh, deviate away from that and add extra columns and put extra information in or, or whatever? Some organisations take a dim view of that. They like you to use their templates as they are. Uh, they don't like you to take parts out of their templates. They like you to just, um, so I've worked in organisations where if you didn't have anything that was applicable, you just write in that section of the template, this is not applicable to my project because 
X, Y, Z. Uh, you wouldn't delete that section of the of the document. Um, you know, there's there's reasons for that. Some organisations think that um, by looking at it and seeing that it's there and seeing that it's not applicable, they know you've considered it. Whereas if you've just deleted it out, they don't know that you've thought of it. Um, so things like that. Um, but stakeholder register, that's part of stakeholders and, and part of planning. Uh, plan artifacts, so they've got a whole bunch of them as well there and, and when they might be useful. You know, do we want to have a release plan? Uh, you know, we should definitely have a scope management plan and a risk management plan, but some of these other ones you might decide, you know, you're not doing your project in iterations. So you don't need an iteration plan if you're not doing it in, in iterations. Uh, so they're the sorts of things that we can tailor uh, when it comes to artifact mapping. Uh, another one here, um, you know, things like, uh, for example, uh, we always should have our work breakdown structure and our risk breakdown structure. We should always have a budget and a milestone schedule. So some of these are, are definitely things we would want. Uh, but someone might have mentioned in the chat a little while ago about a burn chart, right? So, you know, that would only be applicable to certain projects uh, that, are, that are using a methodology that incorporates burn charts. Um, you know, most organisations are going to have Gantt charts, but you know, not everyone would use a histogram or an information radiator, for example, or a lead time chart. Um, so they're all things that you get to decide as a project manager whether you want or not based on the kind of project you're running and the organisation that you're in. Uh, some more examples of, of, of these, uh, scatter diagrams, S-curves, use cases, um, velocity charts, you know, again, um, value stream maps. So these may not be something that you want to use on your project, so you would just leave them out uh, or you would choose a different, a different artefact or, or create a different artefact. Uh, some reporting artefacts there, quality reports, risk reports, status reports. Uh, agreements and contracts so that, that here again there's a good example of you know if we don't deal with fixed price contracts we're not going to use those are we we might have all time and materials contracts on our project for example um, so yeah, it is a matter of just looking through the and this doesn't I don't think Pimbock intends this to be an exhaustive list of absolutely everything I think they're sort of saying these are the main ones uh, this is how they map to the performance domains, uh, but you know there, there may be others uh, that uh, that are around as well. So I'll just go back to that last slide. Uh, so I can ask for questions on artifacts now, Jack. Does anybody have any questions on artifacts? There are not currently any in the chat in right. the uh, in the Q and A section. So people might have some as they go. Perhaps, yeah, we can but, come back um, to them in a little bit. Yeah, so hopefully uh, that's given you some uh, indication of how Pinbox sees tailoring working. Uh, I think they're definitely working to be more inclusive of the, the different methods and, and uh, approaches to, to project management that are out there. And certainly recognising that a lot of organisations now are cherry picking from a whole range of different methods uh, to be able to come up with with hybrid methods that are going to suit their projects and suit their organisational environments. Think about something like a, like a, like a local council. Uh, we have local councils here in Australia, those of you that are overseas, you know, small government uh, organisations. Think about uh, how many different types of projects they run. You know, if everything from paving roads and footpaths to putting in playgrounds uh, and, you know, those types of capital works projects, but they also run projects like, you know, community events and markets and, um, you know, Christmas pageants and, you know, all sorts of things that go on uh, that, that need different approaches. So if you're an organisation that, that deals with one kind of product and, one type of, of method of delivery, then you're probably not going to need to tailor a whole lot. But if you're in an organisation where there's lots of different products and lots of different approaches to delivering products, then uh, yeah, having having some uh, guidance on on tailoring is certainly useful. Oh, hello. Yeah. Do we have oh, anything sorry. else? Yes, my, uh, my account just signed myself out and then signed me back in. Um, uh, so Sarah asks, can you be successful with a very light touch PMP one to two pages referencing common processes like change and comms that are already well known? Does that question 
Yeah, that makes sense. So lots of organisations are starting to realise that, um, you know, the the heavy touch, the heavy methodology stuff is turning people off project management, that a lot of people feel like there's more document, they spend more time completing the documents than what they actually do, you know, getting getting the results and running the project. Now, those of us that are project managers kind of roll our eyes at that and go, no, it has to be done properly and we need good governance and we need, you know, a proper scope and, and, um, I, I think there is an argument for light versions of things and as long as it's, it's enough to cover the essentials, that, that is what we should be aiming for. You know, if we are tying people up with lots and lots of hoops and hurdles, um, we won't be surprised when people turn away from project management because, uh, you know, if there's a, a quick way of doing something uh, that is still going to get the best outcome or, the, or a good outcome, then, um, you know, I, I can see that that would work. So you can get good results from light structures and, you know, uh, efficient structures. And I, I think we should be aiming for that. In fact, a lot of methods, a lot of the agile methods promote that now. They're saying no waste or, or reduce waste as much as you can. So lean is one of those types of methods that says we should be doing everything we can to reduce inefficiency and reduce wastes of time. And, you know, if we can get a streamlined method going where we're doing sort of, you know, one to two page plans and as long as it's covering what it needs to cover, then uh, that's all we need to do. Fantastic. Um, Enrico asks if there is an end indication of when the PIMBOK 7 will be included in the PMP exam, in your opinion. Yeah, look, I've been looking for that because uh, when when we went to design this short course, I, I was hoping that they would already have that. I think there's going to be a transition period uh, of at least a couple of months where they're transitioning people out from, you know, the pin box six, which is what the current situation is. Uh, I haven't checked in the last sort of two weeks or so, but when we did the first day of, of, of this short course, they were still working on the pin box six based exam. So... I don't think it'll be too far away. We've got to remember that Pinbox 7 has been out for almost 12 months now. So it came out in August last year and it's already mainstream now in universities and, uh, you know, in short courses like this one and and with other organisations as well. So people are starting to get around it. Uh, I don't think it'll be too far away. I think we'll see it within the next sort of three to four months for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, Stephen asks, which is the document that compares the original requirements and compares with what was actually delivered at the project end? Is that re- the requirements traceability matrix? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we, we have that uh, to measure at the end. So that's uh, we're on that slide as we speak. Uh, that's where we would use that there to measure. You know, we, we obviously plan for the requirements. We aim to deliver the requirements and then at the end, uh, we, we review and have a look. And that's why when we are planning our requirements, it's very important to have that, uh, that verification information uh, for each requirement in that traceability matrix to say, this is uh, what we, we want, uh, what we want it to look like, and this is how we're going to measure it. And this is, you know, the outcome that's acceptable uh, so that when we're delivering it, we can aim towards that. And then when we're measuring it, we can make sure that we have actually achieved those targets. I did see that uh, someone has asked a question about print two in the general chat box. So the Office of Commerce and Governance were the people who created print two, and it was yeah the UK government. Just off off the track there, Jack. Sorry, <laughs> not a problem. That's all. <laughs> so the corner of my eye, I saw one. <laughs> um, yeah, we we just have one final question currently in the Q and A, which is asking. Uh, if you're new to PIMBOK, is there a need to study PIMBOK 7 or does one just continue to study and practice PIMBOK 7? I assume that the first instance of PIMBOK 7 there was meant to say PIMBOK 6. Yeah, look, no, I'd start with 7. I think if you were going to go back to 6, although it does provide some good foundation in terms of each of the knowledge areas of project management and the and the, the process groups I actually think for someone new and starting that might actually add add more confusion uh, I would start with the seven and move on from there just bear in mind that some people will still be talking the old language they'll still be talking about knowledge areas and process groups maybe if you just read up on what they are and just have a general understanding of them that will help uh, so there's 10 knowledge areas and there's five process groups um, and a lot of them roughly align to these performance domains and, and, uh, and you know, um, principles that guide behaviour as well. Um, but, yeah, I'd, I'd just learn the 10 knowledge areas and the five process groups, have a rough understanding of them, and then just move forward to, to, to Pinbox 7. 
Great. And uh, another one uh, about the Pimbok uh, structure, I suppose, um, asking, should I still use Pimbok for the PMI ACP exam? Uh, yes, so PMBOK 6 is still the, the, the basis or the foundation of all of the, the PMP and the CAPM exams out of PMI at the moment. Uh, so that was that question earlier about um, when it's going to change over to PMBOK 7, uh, and we don't know that, but hopefully it'll be soon. I think they'll run both parallel for a little while just so, it, so people who have just finished courses on PMBOK 6 can get their certification and, and then they'll probably have to do some sort of upgrade through their CPU points or whatever to, um, to, to you know, uh, hold the, the certification uh, at the level seven equivalent. But um, yeah, I think that uh, that'll happen over time. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, that is all of our questions. Uh, was there anything that you would like to cover just before we wrap up and I'll go over a little bit of final housekeeping? Yeah, no, nothing else that I wanted to cover. Just good luck with the uh, the exam, everyone. I hope that uh, everybody passes and uh, that uh, you've gotten a lot out of the short course and uh, that you've enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karen. Really, really appreciate. I'm sure everybody is giving a round of applause to their computers privately at home right now. Um, uh, yeah, really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, if people have enjoyed this content and are interested in taking uh, more subjects with Karen, uh, this content for this short course is taken from the subject MGI 511, Project Management Fundamentals, which Karen teaches uh, in the IT Masters in Charles Sturt University uh, Graduate Certificate, Graduate Diploma and Masters of Project Management. Um, if you are interested in potentially studying and you'd like to check your eligibility for that, uh, Kit is going to just drop the link in the uh, chat currently, um, which will uh, take you to our eligibility assessment form. Feel free to fill that in if you are interested in further study with us. Um, everybody is very welcome to take as many of our free online short courses as they like. Um, and just a little bit more um, housekeeping as well, uh, a few questions about the exam. The exam will open uh, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Melbourne time. So that's Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it will be 40 multiple choice questions. You will have one hour to answer those and you have one attempt to answer them. I don't believe that there is currently a specific due date for that uh, exam. So don't worry about due dates, although, you know, sooner is probably better to keep the content fresh in your mind. Um, and yes, if you complete and pass three of our short courses, which are available at itmasters.edu.au, um, you will be able to claim one subject worth of course credit towards any of our full length graduate certificate or master's courses. Um, we really welcome people to do that, but we also welcome people just uh, enjoying the short course content for itself. Um, and we really, really appreciate everybody's participation in this. Um, thank you so much once again, Karen, for a fantastic short course for Pimbok. Um, thank you to Kit and also to Hannah, who's not here, uh, for doing the tech support and the kind of behind the scenes situations. Um, for us throughout the last four weeks. Thank you to Shane for filling in for me while I was too sick last week. Um, thank you very much. Please find uh, all of the additional uh, resources and discussions on the forums at learn.itmasters.edu.au. That's where all of the material uh, will be available and it will also be uh, where you can best contact Hannah and Kit who will be able to answer any questions about the exam or the course itself and the course material. Um, thanks very much, everybody. And I am just about to uh, end the session. Thank you, everyone. Bye.